Welcome to this week's edition of the 6-5 Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst and Founding Partner at Futurum Research, joined by my always esteemed, always with a slightly brighter screened <laughs> podcast co-host, Patrick Moorhead of More Insights and Strategy. Patrick, good afternoon. Oh, it is a good afternoon because after the 6-5 Summit uh, ending yesterday, uh, it was great to see... Um, how well it came off, you know, these things aren't perfect, but uh, the team just kicked absolute butt and uh, the companies and the content, uh, I've received a lot of compliments on and I know you have too. Yeah, it's been, it was a great event and for anyone that missed it, it's not too late. Uh, we threw an event uh, based upon our podcast here called The 6-5 Summit and it's at the65summit.com. We kicked it off with a introductory warm welcome from none other than Michael Dell. Uh, and he had some great things to say. And I'd love to have heard more from him, but we backed it up. We brought in Lisa Sue, president and CEO of, uh, of AMD, superstar, rock star. And then um, Douglas Merritt from Splunk, the CEO of Splunk. So three big publicly traded CEOs kicked off our event. And then we added over 30 more sessions with tons of big companies. I won't over promote it, but would love to have you go check it out, www.the65summit.com. And we're going to do it again next year. So just a preface for all you out there listening and all of those great tech companies, you can get involved. But for this show, six topics, five minutes each, deep analysis, minimum news. We've got a great show. We're going to dive into a number of topics. Uh, Samsung's unpacked this week. We had a bunch of earnings last week. We had some uh, federal uh, news from the Hill on big tech, uh, a couple of other little announcements. So before we jump in, just a reminder for everyone out there, this show is for information and entertainment purposes only. And while we will be talking about publicly traded companies, we might even talk about their stocks and their stock performance. We are not soliciting or offering any sort of investment advice. So don't buy any stocks or sell any stocks based upon our very smart and very sage recommendations. So Patrick, are you ready to do this thing? My helmet is on. Let's do this. My helmet, he says. I like it. All right, Pat. So I'll let you kick this off. Uh, I've been talking for a while, but I'll make you do the hard stuff. Samsung yeah. did their big annual unpacked event, or actually it's usually about twice a year, right? And last time, I think you and I were in the same building at the same time, was at their last unpacked. This time it was very different, but yet still quite eventful. Yeah, earlier earlier this year was my last business trip, which happened to be uh, unpacked in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, this one was obviously online. Uh, the new leader of uh, Samsung Mobile, um, TM Rowe, uh, kicked it off. And uh, I thought, you know, all in all, it was a good, uh, it was a good event. Uh, some of the uh, interesting things, and again, uh, you can read the news uh, anywhere, but, but uh, they did do some interesting things, I think, competitively related to uh, Apple. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go in reverse order of the way the news came in. Uh, Apple brought out uh, brand new uh, earbuds, uh, basically called uh, the uh, Buds Live, acoustic uh, echo cancellation, which is the killer feature that the AirPods Pro has from Apple that everybody loves. Um, I'm, I actually have a pair. And unlike my AirPods Pro, they don't fall out when I run, when I get all sweaty. And I think that's a, uh, that's a definite plus. So as far as I'm consumed, concerned from a, a consumer standpoint, it's a two-horse race right now in, in audio. What's not a two-horse race right now in premium smartwatches is, uh, yeah, our, our smartwatches, where Apple Watch runs away with the show on the high end uh, and Fitbit uh, on the low end uh, and Xiaomi. Uh, but uh, very similar to the Buds Live, uh, Samsung brought out a very compelling Watch 3. And why is it compelling? It has some uh, health features that Apple does not namely uh, blood pressure and uh, VO2 max. It also does SpO2, ECG, uh, in addition to uh, things like uh, sleep. Uh, also, but not discussed a lot around the watch, 
is they have some cool alloys like uh, titanium that, that you can choose from. So uh, does Apple potentially have a, a run for its money uh, on, on watches, high-end smartwatches? Uh, we're going to have to see. And very quickly, uh, the company updated the uh, Galaxy Note 20, which took a lot of the goodness from the uh, uh, Galaxy Ultra a Galaxy S20 Ultra Plus, that was a mouthful, uh, and added that to the Note 20, even taking it up a notch uh, with even better focus for that insane 100X lens uh, that it has out there and even a, a better two, uh, sorry, a better uh, display. Um, and finally, uh, we got an upgrade to the Fold, which I have to tell you is the most exciting uh, thing that I saw the entire show. Uh, all the chat, not not the issues or things I didn't like, um, but the things that I thought could do better uh, on the first Galaxy Fold, uh, it's thinner. There's a smaller gap, 120 hertz. That top display is a full display now, not, not a half display. The battery life is better by more than a third. It's more durable. It has 5G. Uh, and we're looking uh, less than a year ago that they brought out the first edition. So, Daniel, I know I was kind of a pig on this one, but innovation everywhere. That's all right. I'm uh, I'm rocking a Samsung. I've got the uh, 5G, the S25 G. Still got the S10 Plus on yep. the LG. I've got my tools. I've got my earbuds. Uh, two was it called or the second version called the two. earbud two and i like those a lot uh, i still got to say between all the buds i can't find any that don't fall out of my ears when i run i don't know like walking around on the phone they're all really good but when i need to start yeah. moving um i wish any of them would i'm gonna like tape them on, tape them on around my head you know listen I'll, I'll keep my comments short on this one but samsung continues to be a competitive force apple Nobody's doubting. We've seen how its prices rock. We've seen how even with what I would call um, somewhat late to the party technologies, people love it. People use it. People will put up with the abuse. They will put up with the uh, the lagging technology because Apple does have that, uh, um, that ephemeral aficionado class. But Samsung's products have come a long way. And I will say, for me, the Fold 2 was the showstopper. I saw it. I want it. I'm going to buy it. Well, first, I'm going to beg Samsung to send me one. And if they don't send me one, then I'm going to buy it. Um, but I want them to hear this. So if you heard this, Samsung, I'm not going to buy it. But all honestly, that's a really cool device. Now, I will say, Pat, because we aren't traveling as much, I do wonder, because that was the most wicked device for on the road. But now that I'm home... I don't know if it's quite as cool. So Samsung, how about a vaccine or a treatment? You guys are big. Put the billions to work. Let's do it. All right, moving on. Second topic, Amazon earnings. Wow. What a absolute destruction of estimates. So first of all, Pat, just want to kind of preface this. We've done a few earnings shows now. We're kind of into the tail end of the big tech earnings season yet again. Um, but last week was a huge one. One day we had Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, all on the same day. You and I were running around like chickens with our heads cut off, uh, TV, radio, press quotes, and of course, trying to write and cover all this stuff. Um, but Amazon, I think everyone expected tech to do well. Because if you haven't been through this quarantine and have not been ordering stuff from Amazon, then I don't know how you've been surviving. I don't. Um, I don't think a day goes by that something doesn't arrive. So we thought it would do well, and it did. Almost $89 billion in revenue against a target of $81 billion. Wow, what a quarter. Now, the real mind-boggling part, though, was the profitability of the company. The estimated earnings, Pat, $1.46 a share. Do you remember what it came in at? I'm going to quiz you real quick. No idea. I don't I don't dollar, stocks. $10.30 a share. It beat expectations by over eight bucks um, a share. So, of course, uh, Amazon won, uh, was over, Google was over, Apple was over, Facebook was over. Everybody beat. Tech is screaming. So they're doing well. Now, the one thing that was really interesting, Pat, going into this is we heard a lot about Amazon's making massive investments in its marketplace, 
in sustainability and in COVID-19 right. uh, optimization. And so a lot of the analysts, including I think you, but definitely me, all were suspicious that the margins might actually take a hit because despite the high revenues, I thought they were spending. And, and on top of the things I mentioned, also the same day shipping, enhancements in fulfillment centers, right. uh, all the hiring that's being done, the improvements in infrastructure. And we'll get into AWS in a minute, Pat, but they've been spending big on AWS as well to optimize and grow that business. And all those, and that being a profit cash cow for the business, you're thinking, but here's a couple, here's a couple little things. And now I'm being a pig. But the um, interesting thing about the last quarter was people were spending on a lot more luxury goods. Yeah. And I don't know if it was the stimulus checks. I don't know if it was the extra unemployment. I don't know if business is better than we're hearing in the news. But the first quarter, Amazon's numbers were good, but the earnings were off because people were buying groceries. People right. were buying oh my uh, staples and necessities. This quarter, they're buying Lululemon pants and new Samsung phones and Apple ear, ear, <laughs> earpods. They're buying stuff that's more expensive and not all from Amazon, but just across the board. And that pushed earnings up. We saw the same thing with the iPhone beating right. estimates by almost 20%. So, and that's typically a number that they get really well. So I'll quickly touch on AWS and then I'll let you jump in because I know this is where you get most excited, but AWS, 29% growth, um, law of large numbers, $10.81 billion in revenue. That is massive. The You're talking about almost a $44 billion run right now. And this company, this part of the company has been uh, providing almost 77% of the bottom line to Amazon. So you think about Amazon and how big it is and how profitable it is. But AWS is the profit machine and it is the most robust business inside of Amazon. And while 29% might sound slowed compared to the triple digit and high double digits of competitors and itself in the past, that's a great number considering all of the economic circumstances that the company have been facing. Yeah, it was it was incredible. And, and to your point uh, about their sh uh, mix shift, uh, I had the chance to uh, talk to uh, Amazon's uh, leader of Prime, Jamil Kahani, uh, last week, and we chatted about this. And uh, the company hired 175,000 workers, 175,000 workers that made it possible to not only get uh, items uh, above food and uh, toilet paper uh, in there, and the things that that used to have a two week lead time on Prime uh, went down to more of like a two two or three days. So, um, and, and on your your talk about earnings per share, by the way, that includes a four billion dollar investment that the company made in in COVID nineteen. Which, by the way, five hundred million of that were bonuses uh, to workers. Um, and, and some other uh, really big highlights, I'll call them non-financial highlights. Uh, they sold more third-party products than first-party products, okay? These are, the, these are these small business sellers uh, that we've heard of, and I know we're going to talk about at the very, uh, about the uh, end of the show. And finally, this quarter, they sold $3.4 billion in SMB products uh, as well. So, um, you know, it's funny. So many people try to put Amazon in a corner. It's all out for them. The richest man in, a, in the world. Uh, but I, I really feel like they're, they're going, uh, the extra mile for their employees, uh, and their, and their sellers. And obviously we saw a 5% uptick, uh, and their shareholders too. Kind of everybody's winning at this point. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, uh, there's a lot of negative press, but not all of it is, is, is right and not all of it is, in, uh, is complete. But as we know right now, unfortunately, we pull uh, snippets from data and we utilize it to validate our own points more often than we actually provide analysis on the whole picture. So hopefully those of you listening here realize that we like to talk about the whole picture and there's always things that a company like Amazon can do better but right yep. now, when the economy is in the situation it's in, this company is, is creating a lot of jobs. In fact, I believe it's creating more jobs in the United States than any other company right now. So 
And yes, not all of them are high paying, but even their entry level jobs are significantly higher paying than a lot of the fast food and fifteen dollars an hour, <clears throat> which is the wage that that a lot of people have been asking for to 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 break in. So let's jump to the third topic. Let's 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 go to the other end of the spectrum, Pat. Yeah. We're going to talk more earnings, but let's talk about spectrum. Well, let's talk about connectivity. Let's talk about Qualcomm. Okay. All right. Pun intended. Um, since I ripped and roared through uh, Amazon and didn't leave a lot on the bone, do you want to take a first stab at Qualcomm? Because absolutely, all right, absolutely. Let's... So pretty much uh, everything was above guide. EPS was above. Revenue uh, was slightly above uh, the midpoint. Um, and by the way, uh, the market loved it, crushed it. They were up nine percent uh, after hours, and and part of that. Uh, was what I like to call the de-risking of of the company uh, or or the stock. So they made an announcement that uh, they have they have um, inked deals with every single uh, they have long term license agreements with every single handset maker uh, on the planet. Uh, and in the subhead of their earnings press release was Huawei, uh, which was a big one. Uh, also, what came in is they stuck to their uh, guidance on 5G phones, where their profitability is four to five times that of, that's my estimate, uh, of LTE. And oh, by the way, 63% of all phones sold in China were 5G. So don't get stuck on what you see in the United States yet, because we're you know still in, you know mired uh, in this. But emerging regions are growing again. Uh, and, and the final thing, and then I'll, I'll hand this back over to you, um, some of the declines that they had in, in some of their expansion areas like automotive uh, were more than made up in the gains that they've made in their RF businesses. In fact, uh, if I look at the numbers of, of the RF business, which was uh, uh, let out of the bag, um, it makes Qualcomm bigger than many of the largest pure play RF vendors. So you have a, a, a massive player in digital and analog whose analog business in RF smartphones is bigger than the pure plays. And I think that's that was one of the untold stories of, of, of the earnings. And rapidly approaching the Broadcom numbers, eh? Ah, Corvo, Skyworks. I, I don't know. Those are even bigger businesses. Yeah, Broadcom's really uh, really focused on the Apple business, but it's that other 75% of the business. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, like you said, came in above um, solid. This wasn't uh, an Amazon in the sense of blowing things out, but this was also a company that didn't have nearly as robust of a uh, set of offerings for this COVID pandemic situation. But Deep beneath the surface, the connectivity that we are enjoying here in the United States is really created in many ways by the technologies that have been developed and rolled out through 3GPP, um, 4G LTE, which is what many of us here in the U.S. are using still, 5G. And Qualcomm is the technology that powers many of the devices, if not most, and of all the high-end ones, almost all of the devices. And then you add to that uh, you know, the work from home, the opportunity that 5G is going to play to deliver uh, high bandwidth and throughput to people's home offices, to remote workplaces, to, uh, you know, flexible work environments. The company's in a really good position. Uh, a couple of things that also caught uh, attention was the company did, um, you know, finally come to terms with Huawei. And uh, that was a big deal. It kind of was, it was, it was a little muted, but don't mistake that as not an important piece of news. Those two companies working together is going to mean uh, very significant revenues uh, for Qualcomm. The 5G licensing growth is, is fantastic. A couple highlights that I think were worth mentioning, 380 operators now in 5G, uh, 35 countries that are launching 5G commercial ser services now and over 80 operators doing that. 45 different handset makers now are using 5G devices. And as you mentioned, Pat, that's 60 plus percent in China, 5G. Pretty soon it's going to be over 60% of all of Qualcomm's smartphone, all the sh smartphone shipments that are using Qualcomm's technology are going to be 5G. That is going to lead to a big business. I've been saying in 19 that 2020 was going to be the year of 5G. 
I'm going to rewrite the article. 2021 is going to be the year. 2020 was a big move in terms of broad announcements, uh, go live. But I think in the year 2021, as we get refreshed and as Apple does bring out its Qualcomm powered 5G device, 5G will be here to stay. It will be the year of 5G. We also have a lot to talk about with the enterprise implications of 5G, but we're going to have to talk about those later, Pat. You know, I, before we shift to the next topic, I have to bring this up. I was doing a little charting here. Uh, Apple uh, filed its lawsuit against uh, Qualcomm in um, January of 2017. On February 3rd, the stock closed at 52, uh, and it closed today at 111. Uh, 111.39. That's <laughs> roaring. But don't buy it because of anything we said. No, no, no. All right. here, it is at the highest all time ever. I've it's, got the, uh, it's I'm, absolutely I'm, ripping. I find stock out there even bigger than 2000. Anyways, speaking of stocks that are ripping, all right, fourth and final, um, our fourth and final topic uh, on earnings. So we have a couple more, but our final earnings, Pat. AMD firing on all cylinders. I wrote that article. I put that out there. Pat, you know, I want to go first, but I'm actually going to hand you this one because I know that you love yourself talking about some AMD. Can you jump into this one? Absolutely. Yeah, AMD ripped it. By the way, they're in an all-time high ever, uh, even higher than when I was there. So sad. Um 26% growth overall, uh, records in CCG, which is client computing group, uh, and servers. Uh, they had 45% growth in CCG with a big focus on how they're doing in Ryzen notebooks. And uh, what's the driver of that? It's the new 4000 series, which uh, I am hearing uh, is super popular for back to school and even uh, for the holidays, uh, it's going to go head to head with Intel's new Tiger Lake uh, that's going to come out at the end of the year. It's the highest client CPU revenue in 12 years and highest notebook revenue ever. Again, so sad. The prior record was when I was there. So that's OK. That's OK. I, I applaud the folks at AMD. Uh, I've been a little harsh on Epic uh, revenue. Um, they doubled revenue and they had some big deals that we saw even announced this week with Google that looks like the company is getting a lot more uh, momentum there. And of course, they increased their 2020 guide, which I think was a nice uh, uh, capping uh, uh, of there. So all around uh, really good uh they rose, uh, they, they increased its guidance from 25 to 32% growth. I think there's yeah. conservativeness in there, by the way. Yeah, well, they're back to kind of their pre-COVID estimates, just solid. Uh, not surprising for tech. Yeah. You know, I am one of the hardest critics on AMD. And so it took a little bit of uh, humble pie for me to swallow uh, I've said for a long time, I felt the company was a little soft in terms of being able to capitalize on some of Intel's, uh, you know, delays. And to this day, I'll still say that there's an opportunity for AMD to go even faster. But in a lot of ways, the company has been extremely successful. And what has been most impressive to me has been the accuracy in which Dr. Lisa Su has been able to forecast product, forecast growth chart charted success. And I even think her proclamation of double digit uh, market share for Epic was this quarter, which uh, I think. Yeah. Based how upon did I forget new, that? She said they hit it. I can't believe I forgot that. Based how upon new numbers, she they hit it. Now, I'm still going to play skeptic a little bit because based upon Intel's growth numbers, because, well, again, remember, Intel missed on process, but did not miss on performance. Oh, and yeah. the, over, long -term. the yeah. overall data center number in TAM, I think, has grown. And so my only thing I'd want to double spot check on those numbers is, are they looking at the right TAM? Because based upon both successes, AMD's tremendous success, as well as Intel's success in data center CPU, 
if they haven't shown reflecting uh, a growth of overall TAM, the market shares could be off. But it's getting close, whether it is 10 or 9 or 11. Um, AMD has really stepped up its feet. And that was a number that a lot of people thought was going to be the catalyst for a much faster acceleration in terms of capturing market share. I, I'm going to watch it closely. Um, you know, I don't think with Cooper Lake that Intel is as far behind as it sounds because seven nanometer versus 10 nanometer plus is not as different as people are making it out to be. But no mistakes here. AMD is executing extremely well. They're very focused. Their product line is much smaller and they're able to be very good in Ryzen, good in Epic. What they're doing, they're being uh, very um, deliberate and they're accomplishing it. And that's going to give the company the catalyst for growth and their shareholders are loving it. That stock was just ripping this week and last week. I think it's I'm pretty like sure I've got, a few, I've got a few market watch articles that I'm going to probably get some some have to eat some crow later. But you know what? I, you know, I call it like I see it. And when I saw it, that's what I saw. And right now, AMD is doing really well. And Intel is going to have to step up its game. Hey, I say game on, Pat. I love seeing innovative companies fighting each other to innovate and out innovate. Um, Innovation, man. It raises everybody's game. And processors uh, needed it and, and they have it and it is truly a, a, a game a game on here. And Daniel, uh, as you noted, what was going on when AMD stock went up uh, so much on Tuesday? I'm pretty sure I was interviewing Lisa Sue uh, on the 6.5 Summit, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I, I was trying to find a correlating data could not, but nevertheless, that was a heck of a good interview. So don't forget to go check that out, uh, the 65summit.com. All right, quick one here. Um, so NVIDIA, so let's just, you know, we'll stick with chips for a minute. So every year there's what's called ML Perf, which is basically the benchmarking for ML um, machine learning performance. And long and short is NVIDIA put forth, it's got its new A100 Tensor Core GPU, um, you know, it's running on its DGX SuperPod, its supercomputer, and um, NVIDIA absolutely knocked it out of the park. So this year, they, they lit eight different categories from image classification to natural language processing, um, you know, reinforcement learning, object detection. NVIDIA won every category. And so long and short, NVIDIA maintained its superiority as the training, uh, as, as the training processor company. And that actually, I don't think has been all that disputed. But what was most interesting to me this year, Pat, about its uh, the recognition it received in its ML Perf is ML Perf is starting to to dive more into traditional CPU workloads that are being done on the GPU and with the frameworks, software, um, and hardware that NVIDIA is putting forward now. And you know they announced uh, Merlin, Jasper, which are you know recommendation engine and uh, natural language processing for um, inference type workloads, the, uh, the company is starting to see more and more take on those products, challenging the status quo, putting more pressure on our friends at Intel, <laughs> um, uh, because that's really where they've traditionally shined in the data center has been with the uh, x86 CPU for inference. Um, and so the two areas that the company got some really high marks on their ML Perf this year was in uh, recommendation systems and conversational AI. Uh, you know, the uh, company on the recommender side is now working with Alibaba. Its technology is powering Alibaba's $38 billion single day sales record. Um, and then on top of that, the company's got a whole bunch of partners now signed up to use its technology for conversational AI, which is the ultimate sort of next phase of AI and everyday uh, interactions that we're having. So big overall um, you know, performance from NVIDIA. Not a lot of surprise here. My biggest thing for people out there is the CPU versus GPU for inference conversation is coming back. It's bubbling up to the surface, Pat. Yeah, I, I was actually surprised because NVIDIA keeps winning and NVIDIA cannot possibly be, remain the only game in town forever. You know, Google's TPU4 results uh, were promising um, and could finish it up, but it's not commercially available, which, which is why it didn't make the list. Also, too, Qualcomm is coming to town with its cloud A100 design. 
Uh, and finally, uh, Intel with Habana Labs and startup with Cerebrus and GraphCore are making headway, but they didn't post any numbers, which which was uh, which, which was just a shocker. Yeah, Pat. Like I said, this is just a really interesting area. The the there's a lot more players in town, um, but you're starting to really see Jensen and the team at NVIDIA really put its weight behind the GPU and the GPU for all kinds of diverse workloads. Whereas for so long, it just wasn't considered for those particular, uh, you know, that those particular types. And uh, it's getting interesting. It's heating up. And kind of like I said about the AMD Intel, I just love this. I love seeing all these companies because all this is going to do for you and me is it's just going to push and push and push um, the innovation. So let's get on to our last topic here, Pat, because we, uh, we're kind of coming up on time. This is a biggie. And we're going to have to kind of keep it high level because we could spend all day on it, Pat. But look, the, um, the regulators, for some reason, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, in the middle of multiple, um, you know, in, in a national election, uh, inequality and injustice war that's going on in the world, uh, decided they wanted to bring all the big tech companies to Capitol Hill to probe them for some reason about antitrust and anti-competitive behaviors. Um, I'm going to, I'll quickly bite down on this. They brought the four companies the day before their earnings reports, which I thought was hilarious <laughs> because if they brought them a day later, the conversations may have been completely different. Um, cause not, I mean, wow, did they do well? Um, all of them, but what's so interesting to me, Pat is one, the timing ridiculous. I could not get over the fact that our nation's leaders don't realize that, Hey, why don't we try to like get our schools open right now or try to, get this testing uh, backlog down to three days or work on um, this uh, in, you know, unemployment agreement uh, and this benefits package for everybody. Like, because like I said, I think regulating big tech is, is something that has to be done on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis, but I don't understand the timing on it. Second thing, I don't understand the four companies being looked at sort of equally. These particular um, uh, legislators can't barely talk about any one of these companies well enough to yet talk to four of them. So you just heard the comments and just the ridiculousness of some of the questions, the mixing up of the products and services, the misunderstanding of all of their different uh, confluence and influence over the market. Um, Amazon versus Google versus Apple versus Facebook, four completely different companies run with different set of values, morals, products, services. Um, so it was absurd. It was a spectacle to me, uh, if anything. And I just want to say, you know, one of the ironies, Pat, and we talked about this during Amazon's earnings, was that while Amazon may be the biggest of the four, I actually uh, felt listening about all four companies that by far the company that has the least uh, business being probed for anti-competitive is a company that essentially um, has a pretty free enterprising third-party marketplace, creates the most low-paying low entry-level jobs in the country, is growing at scale, putting workers out in trucks, putting uh, factory workers out there, uh, helping small businesses to build uh, you know, online storefronts. I, I kind of didn't get it, that particular one. Like I get the fact that it's so large that it needs to be discussed, but between that versus like a search, controlling search, or controlling information or controlling applications that people are allowed to use versus just a really successful, really big e-commerce company, Pat. That was a weird one to me. Uh, what do you think? So I summed it up and I'll kind of riff off what you said is, is you know, I said on Twitter, uh, you know, the big difference between uh, all these companies that were up there and Amazon is first of all, Amazon has single digit market share in U.S. retail. Um, compared to uh, the share that the other companies have in, in what they do. Uh, Amazon actually creates direct jobs, 175,000 since March. Uh, and I would say that Amazon is, is a big risk taker. And, and I know that this probably doesn't matter on Capitol Hill, but we cannot stop rewarding companies for taking these massive risks uh, and if they're successful, that, that the thought that they need to be punished. I mean, think about this. Amazon was a bookseller and they popped out AWS, which, which we talked about uh, uh, earlier. It just makes no uh, sense to me. And, you know, Daniel, I couldn't help but to notice the comedy of it. Uh, and let me take uh, a direct quote from Tim Cook, Apple. Uh, 
<laughs> or what did Trump say? Apple, Tim Cook. Tim Apple. Tim Apple. Uh, it says, quote, unquote, we do not retaliate or bully people. It's strongly against our customer culture. And I'm thinking, wait a second. Are you kidding me? Uh, and I pulled this out of a Washington Post uh, article, Reid Albergati. Uh, Apple actually had a document um, talking about how it was going to uh, hurt Qualcomm financially and put Qualcomm's licensing model at risk. It also said it sought to create evidence by scrupulously licensing other less expensive patents to make Qualcomm's look more expensive. And then finally, Apple said it would selectively filter a group of patent licenses for the most desirable deals using these patents as evidence as comparable disputes with others. And we didn't hear too much about that because if you remember the day after uh, this came out in what I call the ODM trial uh, down in San Diego, uh, Apple settled with Qualcomm. And I don't know if it was this evidence was way too spicy and it was going to uh, hurt the Apple brand or it was uh, Intel uh, decided that it was going to stop doing uh, motives. But but anyways, the, the comedy uh, of some of the things that, that were discussed, uh, I couldn't ignore and I had to bring up here. Oh, yeah. Those are great points, Pat. I also thought it was interesting how uh, Tim Apple Cook um, <laughs> also segmented a, a premium smartphone tier for his lawsuits with uh, the lawsuits that Apple had with Qualcomm. But suddenly that tier no longer was relevant when talking about domination of a certain market. So um, these guys are great. There's a reason they make a fortune, Pat. They know what they're doing. And listen, I, you know, to some extent, you want to stay a million miles away and never buy a car from these guys. And to some extent, you just kind of got to respect that just the, the audacity that these CEOs have. I mean, Zuckerberg, I, I feel like if you shook his hand, you'd have to count your fingers. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I mean, it's hard. This is not an easy thing to get right. And, yeah. you know, it's easy from, you know, we have a fun job because we just get to, you know, uh, elaborate, uh, pontificate, uh, you know, envision, dream. Um, but anyways, uh, these guys have to run these businesses and it's hard and, you know, they're building things and they're, they're proud and they don't want to give away the market yeah. that they've grown. But, um, the double standards are funny. The hypocrisy is everywhere and darn it regulators. Can you fix like the major problems? And then can we come back to this? Cause you know, the last thing I want right now is to not have my tech because, I mean, you don't you know, I can't leave my house. At least let me at least let me have my tech. All right. Let me have my tech. Or that's what we're going to call this episode. Thanks, everybody out there. Pat, great job. Great analysis, as always. Appreciate everyone listening in on the six five uh, podcast. I was used to saying the summit. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Join us. Stick with us. We're going to post more every week. We'll have more interviews. We'll have more summits, more content. We appreciate every one of you out there for joining us, being part of our community for more tech and more insights. Check this out. Stick with us, but we got to go. Bye-bye. <laughs>